Mike Gill, State of Corruption. Last week, you saw our video, Where's Gill? So why are they looking for me? They're looking for me to find another account that we're paying State of Corruption to keep this website open. That's why they're looking for me. They're doing it in a case called Wiggins and Norrie. You saw me on that video file an appeal, but they didn't accept an appeal, even though we had a receipt for one. They are absolutely desperate. Their timeline and their plan, we've exceeded, and that presents problems, because if you don't get to carry out that plan, the plan as itself exposes you, and that's what's happening now. That's why the clerk of courts, Eileen Fox, just sent us another letter saying it was a supplement, not an appeal even though we had a, a receipt that it was an appeal. This is pure desperation. Now, why? And why on this case? Because they know the family court is one of the most corrupt places in our state. I mean, outside of the drug dealers, this is the biggest money maker, your children. And I was po quite possibly one of the wealthiest people in New Hampshire at that time. I own mortgage specialists, I had the largest racing stable in the world, so I became a target. My good buddy Alex Walker sent me to John Ross. Now who's John Ross? He was the president of Wiggins and Norrie. He was also the Bar Association president at one time. My wife's attorney, Tober, he was also a Bar Association president. Who's representing Ross now? The New England Bar Association president, and they all won Lawyers of the Year. Now watch. You're going to see my attorney, Dallas Sedgwick, in that relationship that I had. Won't believe this. I was watching a movie with her. In bed, right. The devil's advocate, I swear to God. And then I got her to talk. And you're going to see these letters. You can call them love letters, and I'm going to post them. But she goes on to say, I'm going to be the sixth best thing in your life, meaning the five are my children. Except for she talked and she confessed to this corruption and how they use our kids and leverage them, how they planned on stealing millions. They only took somewhere between six and seven million from me. The, the OJ trial cost less money. But I cared more about my children. It wasn't about money. But they know that. So read these letters. I had her confess to what Tober was doing and Ross was doing. In fact, you're going to see a brief recording of her words, her statement that was made in a deposition. And if there's any questions, Eric Renner was there and he took all the notes. Right. So you can see that what she was saying is repeated in these notes that were done in that deposition along with Eric Renner was Nick Alexander. I'll remind you they were from Morris Mahoney, the same people who offered me 50 million as a settlement. Remember Bob Curley was representing Morris Mahoney? This is why, because it opens up the corruption in family courts. Now when Dallas Sedgwick left, I wanted nothing to do with her. And you'll see in these letters, I couldn't be in a relationship with someone who would use children like that. So was it just in my case she broke down? She had to be doing it for years, and that's what these people do. So you get to hear her own words. But you'll see text messages from her during this time. She had to leave town. Walker told her to leave town. You can see that she's afraid for her life. I am scared to death. I will post those so you can read it. Why is a divorce attorney afraid of being murdered? I'll tell you why. Because it's a money maker. She made the mistake of telling me. And I will not back down. So this is why Fox, we can't appeal anything. They'll see these things. They'll see these texts. That's why we couldn't have anybody in as a witness in front of Judge McHugh with Hilliard. The same guy who's out there wanting to close me down. The New England Bar Association. You're going to hear how they turn around and John Ross was going to fake a heart attack in a deposition rather than have it. You'll hear that we have never gotten files and evidence. If you remember Ted Little's text message threatening to murder my kids and say that you've never seen these files. These are the files we're talking about. 
These are the people who run your family courts. You're going to hear the statement from Dallas Sedgwick saying how corrupt it was. It was about stealing. See? This is why they can't have this go forwards. And this is why they have to have state of corruption closed down. Now, I've attached all this evidence and all these pieces so you can read them and listen to yourself. You wonder what goes on in family court? Well, this is the dark side of family court. The dark side. This is the truth in family court. To the point where, do you know what? They want 275000 Remember, I paid somewhere between six and seven for three weeks of work. And you read, you read the letters from her saying what they were doing during those three weeks and the weeks before that. Just before I close, I've got a new text message from Dollar just last week. She found Jesus. That's good because the last photo she sent me was sweaty and modest with a bikini. Mike Gill, State of Corruption. I learned that Steve Tober would be adverse counsel. I knew Tober as he represented Wigan and Nori and had even represented me personally on a sensitive matter. I also knew that Tober was very close to Ross, that the two were good friends, and that Tober had previously represented Ross. From the time Tober first appeared in the case, his litigation tactics were extremely aggressive. Tober took a scorched earth approach. Tober's approach would be to excessively bill the divorce case, all of which would unnecessarily lead to increased legal fees for Gail and depletion of the marital estate. Eventually, it would become clear to me that the goal of Ross and Tober collectively was to extract considerable legal fees out of a once sizable marital estate. In December 2007, Gil became uneasy with Ross as his attorney. I recall numerous telephone calls and in-person conversations with Gil where he informed me that he was not comfortable with Ross as his attorney. I told Ross early on that there was a conflict of interest given the aforementioned legal representations and relationships. I then directed an associate, Megan Beauregard, to perform legal research on the ethical issues involving conflicts of interest. Following our research, I concluded that a material conflict of interest existed and that we needed to disclose the same to the client. At the time, I did not know, but would soon learn from my associate conducting the legal research, that Ross, too, had been represented by Tober in cases involving ethical and legal malpractice violations. Given the above, I prepared a motion to disqualify Tober as attorney for Mr. Gill's wife in the divorce. The basis of the motion was the aforementioned conflicts of interest, the overall impropriety, and the potential significant compromise of the client's interests in a hotly contested divorce. I had countless discussions with Ross regarding the issues of the conflicts and argued strenuously that we move forward on the motion. On several occasions, I asked Ross why he would not permit me to simply talk to the client about the conflicts issues, especially since I had come to learn that Ross, too, had been represented by Tober. I could not understand why Ross was so insistent in his refusal to seek to disqualify Tober. I became so frustrated and distraught over these issues that I began to confide in several people close to me about the ethical dilemma. Specifically, I talked to Megan Beauregard, as well as my then-current husband and even a relative, all with the single goal of trying to find out why a senior partner at my firm would block the disclosure of a conflict of interest. Up until this point in time, I had only the highest regard for Ross. I worked extremely hard on his cases and felt fortunate to work with him. Gill was unaware of the conflicts of interest relating to Tober's prior representation of me, Ross, and Wigan and Nori. However, from the inception of Tober's involvement, Gill was uneasy with having Tober involved in the divorce because just prior to Tober's appearance, the records of a therapist, Dr. Broussard, went mysteriously missing while Gill's wife was represented by attorneys Rona Wise and Matthew Kozel. As I mentioned, in December of 2007, Gill became uneasy with Ross as his attorney. Gill expressed concern that a plan existed between Ross and Tober to build a divorce case excessively. Gill was concerned that Ross did not want to have any contact with him. On numerous occasions, I continued to inform Ross that Gill was uneasy with Tober's involvement and was likewise uneasy with Ross's representation of him. I implored Ross to speak with Gill regarding Gill's concerns. However, Ross did not want to deal with the issue of whether a conflict existed by virtue of Tober's involvement and Ross would not speak with Gill. In Ross's opinion, no conflicts of interest existed by virtue of Tober's involvement. Ross never discussed with me the subject of Tober's prior representation of him. 
Again, I could not understand why Ross seemed to be fighting not to move to disqualify Tober. During this time period, the global economic crisis had begun, and there were numerous infirm discussions about rainmaking and billing clients. It became clear to me that I was being set up for something, and that if anything went wrong with the divorce, I would be blamed. Indeed, I knew that eventually the aforementioned conflicts of interest would lead to real problems with the client. I informed Tober of the motion, and it was clear that he was troubled by it. For example, at a court hearing, following having advised Tober of the motion, Tober appeared to be trying to intimidate me by standing uncomfortably close to me, scowling, and generally looking threatening. I also began to realize that Ross's behavior in litigation style became unusual. For example, Ross informed me that if and when Sarah Gill's deposition would go forward, he would aggressively explore incidents of sexual abuse she suffered in her past. Doing so, however, would not advance the interest of Gill nor be relevant to any issues in the case. It was also out of Ross's character to engage in such lines of inquiry. It then became obvious to me that this line of inquiry would only be used to delay the litigation by forcing Tober to stop the deposition. Indeed, Ross was so committed to preventing the deposition of Sarah Gill in order to allow the extremely lucrative, approximately $100,000 per month case to continue, that he told me that Sarah Gill would never sit for a deposition. Ross said that either Ross or Tober would feign a heart attack or some other medical problem in order to stop the deposition. Ross told me multiple times that Sarah Gill's deposition was simply not going to happen. Meanwhile, it seemed as though every effort I made to advance the case was being thwarted. For example, I tried for many months to secure the deposition of the opposing party, Sarah Gill. Yet, when I would discuss this with Ross, he seemed unconcerned that we were unable to secure the deposition. Likewise, as discussed below, Ross was unconcerned and uninterested in the mysterious unavailability of Dr. Brassard's records. While Ross and I had worked closely together for years, there was now obviously sharp tension between us, and he was beginning to communicate less with me. I began to believe that Tober and Ross were in constant communication and were conspiring to frustrate the case from being advanced to closure. During this time frame, Wigan and Nori's financial challenges became more acute. For example, there were no bonuses distributed at the end of 2008, and the litigation activity in the firm had declined precipitously. The firm had many meetings regarding its financial challenges and the economic slowdown generally in the legal profession during this economic recession. As the case continued, it became clear to me that anything concerning the case which I would tell Ross would soon be learned by Tober. I concluded that Ross was not representing the best interest of the client, but instead was acting in collaboration with Tober to continue the case and continue the sizable monthly legal fees being paid by Gill. Despite all the fees and my best efforts, Depositions had been blocked or thwarted, and other depositions, such as Sarah Gill's, as noted above, surely would not take place under Ross's watch. I no longer trusted Ross. I stayed out of the office as much as possible. Occasionally, Ross would call me and inquire about the case. His most common question was to inquire about the client's current thinking. Through my conduct in the case, I began to make it clear to Ross that I would not be a party to what I saw as unethical conduct, and this created greater distance between me and Ross. Eventually, this friction was expressed in an email response that I had sent to Ross. He had asked me, in an email, to engage in some ethically questionable conduct, and I responded that I would not do it. By this point, I was close to leaving the firm. I did express to Ross the client's displeasure with the case, the lack of depositions, and other related issues. I informed Ross that the client wanted to interview other law firms. I soon interviewed William Levine of Lee and Levine in Boston, Massachusetts, as potential successor counsel to Wigan and Nori, I explained to Levine that depositions had not been conducted, that discovery efforts were being thwarted by Tober without resistance from Ross, and that we had not obtained the therapy records of Sarah Gill. I said that I needed to find successor counsel who could properly represent Gill's interests. I also informed Levine about Ross's conflict given Tober's involvement and Ross's apparent efforts to force the expensive case to continue by delaying necessary proceedings, among other things. They listened to what I had to say and agreed to a second meeting. After listening intently to the challenges I was facing in representing Gill, Levine advised me that the situation would not likely end well with Wigan and Nori. He then gave me the name of another lawyer with an expertise in ethics. That lawyer, who also listened intently as to what I had to say, advised me to leave the law firm of Wigan and Nori. 
As for the therapy records of Sarah Gill, they had been in custody of her therapist, Dr. Broussard. At various times, Dr. Broussard's office had represented that the records didn't exist due to one, a water and flood problem, two, a fire, and three, an accidental shredding by Dr. Broussard's secretary. Broussard's office even stated that the records might be in storage. Ross rejected my efforts to challenge in court these suspect and inconsistent grounds for allegedly not having medical records. I came to the conclusion that Dr. Broussard's records may not, in fact, have been destroyed, given my review of the records of Dr. Garber, which note that he reviewed Dr. Broussard's records in which detail a conversation Dr. Garber had with Dr. Broussard, wherein Dr. Broussard acknowledges the existence of the records. From time to time, I had heard Ross make highly derogatory comments about Gill. This was unusual as he typically did not make such comments about his own clients. Later in the case, as I began to understand what was happening between Ross and Tober, I reflected upon the fact that Ross strongly encouraged me to communicate with Tober by telephone rather than in writing, even insisting that I do so even though every phone conversation I had with Tober would subsequently be misrepresented by Tober, leading to follow-up letters, disputes, delay, and more legal fees. For this reason, I had long preferred to communicate with Tober in writing so as to eliminate such unnecessary work and delay. Ross never explained to me his rationale for why I should only communicate with Tober via telephone and not in writing. At some point toward the very end of my relationship with Wigan and Nori, I told Ross that I know what's going on here. I recall making a statement along the lines of, how much money do you need? I gave my notice to Wigan and Nori, advising them that I would be leaving the firm.